I am responsible for myself and my actions. I shall conduct myself honorably and live a clean and frugal life. I have responsibilities to my fellow citizens. I shall be loyal to them and humble, because we are all elements of a greater whole and without them I am nothing. I have responsibilities to our society. I shall understand and respect my place in it, defend it, and work to make it prosperous, so that I may receive society's protection, and that we may hand on safety and prosperity to future generations. From the Octus canon so we're talking about all fathers today that's right it's another thursday it's gear talk time that means i get to talk about gears of war for roughly i don't know 10 to 30 minutes because that's normally what ends up happening when i aim for a video to be like 10 but we're here talking about the all fathers um i'm not gonna touch too much on the government itself for the cog for the coalition of border governments i don't really want to touch on it that much uh just Forewarned, this video is going to be on All Fathers pretty much by themselves. I'll go a little bit of the history that led up to them, but nothing much because there's videos on the history of Sarah I can make, the history of the Cog, the Cog itself, pretty much the Age of Silence, the Age of Armageddon, the Gold Rush. I can talk about all that, the Pendulum Wars. All of that is a topic on its own. And to make that all fit into this, into one singular video, it wouldn't be able to happen. I would not be able to make this video less than an hour long if I was going to try. So I'm going to touch on the All Fathers today. I'm going to talk about who they were, how they started, and pretty much what they are, who was in it. I also want to touch on the founding families that were around at that time. And at the very end, a little bit involving Anya Stroud. Why Anya? Don't worry. If you played Gears 5, you know the reason, but we'll go over it. Now, the All Fathers are eight statesmen that all came together from their homelands, their countries, or their territories, and formed the Coalition of Ordered Governments. Pretty much eight different people came together with their pretty much territories and formed one singular pretty much government to rule all eight of them and surrounding territories that they're allied with. Now, for instance, the Southern Islands. As far as I, am, I know of, because they don't state a lot for many of the members... For the pretty much allied, well, they state the allied nations, but they don't state like the allied people or like who the eight statesmen were they represented. We only know a few of them and only one of them we really know where they represented. But the Southern Islands, as far as we know of, that's an allied state to the COG. That's not COG, that's not one of the eight. That's not one of the main eight that joined in. That's just someone who's allied with and kind of like how America has Samoa or Puerto Rico. That's kind of how it is for the Southern Islands. They are their own country. They run their own stuff, but they're just allied with the COG. Now, out of these eight people that joined together to make this happen, how old or how long ago do you think it happened? How long ago was the COG formed? Not even the COG, but just the eight, the eight members of the COG that started. The eight All Fathers. How long ago? We're sitting around the mid-40s and uh ae right now i believe 42 was gears 4 so maybe 43 or something right now around that time so how long before emergence day how long just just throw out your number age of armageddon lasted a while that was a long time ago pretty much sword and shield times back then uh, age of silence that was all about the renaissance you know what I'll, I'll give you the answer i'll give it to you at the end of the age of silence towards the gold rush and when emulsion was first found that's when the all fathers stepped in all eight of them came together because of the fact that they saw the situation with emulsion after the age of silence and the huge renaissance that took over the world and threw humanity into a prosperous place and just how technologically advanced they slowly became over that time which for us is a very quick time if you look at it they saw emulsion as this thing that'll pretty much have another boom to the population of the planet give another huge boon to like technology prosperity of mankind the ideals being passed along like, like it's a secondary renaissance they saw this stuff could create so these eight people came together and decided if we all come together and pool our resources we can create a utopia for our people we can have it so that all of us are living in this utopia together. We're all thrown into this vast technological spike that we're going to be seeing, and we're all together, and we can all grow. That's what they kind of said to the people. What it really was was they started to see emulsion as being argued over since it was like oil. It's not just everywhere. There's pockets of it here and there. And what happened was is that these eight people came together and were like, okay, if we all come together, we all pull our stuff together, we can either A 
fight off all the armies that come after us to try and get our emulsion, or B, we can just attack them and steal their stuff. Either way, we're getting their emulsion. That's going to be the definite. Pretty much that's what it was. It, it sounds evil, but at the end of the day, if you think about it, in a military, that's that's kind of a normal thing. I don't consider it... I consider it evil by the sound of it, but not like, oh my god, these people are horrible. So that's pretty much what it was. Eight people came together to pool their resources and become a superpower. That's pretty much what it was. Out of these eight, we only know three names. One of them I know off the top of my head, the other two I had to write down. We have Nassar Embry, Olafsson, and Pomeroy. Those are the only three we know of, of the eight... The eight all fathers that began everything. That's all we know. We do not know what they did, where they came from, or what their lands were. We only know anything really about Nassar Embry, because as far as we can tell, he's the one that led everything. He, that's stated, but it seems like he was the one that was from the home area of uh, pretty much like where where the events take place for Gears of War. Um, I always get it mixed up for Tyrus or Ephira. I think Afira is the name of the capital and Tyrus is like the country. So he was like the representative of Tyrus, I would like to guess. If I have everything backwards, I'll write something down here. I'm horrible trying to get those two together. I always mix them up. Uh, let's jump in, take a look at Nassar Embry first. Take a look at the other two and then talk more about uh, pretty much pretty much everything else revolving around like their political structure at the time without really diving too deep into it. Starting off with Nassar Embry. He was pretty much the leader of everything. Um, originally, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, I'll put it down here, I, Alexia or something, I can't remember, there was a man who originally threw out the idea of a coalition of order government, how the government would work if it were to be formed. The coalition did not exist at this point, this was roughly 150 to 200 years back. He wrote down and pitched the idea of this is how the government should be formed, this is how it should be run with a coalesce of all these countries coming together. Now, that wasn't put into effect, but it created a political party one that Nassar Embry believed in, and when he rose to power and he formed all these guys together, he was the one who put this political plan into action. It was tinkered a bit to be something of his own, but he went together with the rest of them and they created the Octus Canon. What the Octus Canon is, is pretty much like our Declaration of Independence, but their declaration of we're all coming together and this is how our civilization is going to be run. Pretty much all the citizens have to take the pledge of we are COG civilians, and we are with the COG. We are signed with the COG, pretty much, is how it goes, even if you're a civilian. That's kind of how it runs, and he adopted this idea to create that. Uh, as far as we can tell from him, he seemed to be a soldier at the time. You can definitely tell because his mother, it stated, was a soldier, and in his, pretty much in his portrait, he's wearing the old school, he's wearing his armor, he's got a blade in his hand. It, it looks a lot, it looks really Warhammer 40k-ish, but that's how it was. Roughly 150 years ago, before the emulsion really boomed everything up, they were still wearing the armor and everything for ceremonial reasons instead of just like a suit or a tie like they wear currently. Back then, they still had the armor and everything. The Renaissance stuff just ended, but the other boom was still coming. His armor is also found at Halvo Bay in Judgment. You see the armor. That is his actual armor that's still around. His armor still has, like, unlike him, his armor survived the test of time, and they do keep it in good, pristine condition. They make sure everything's taken care of. The highest decoration you can get, pretty much, in the cog is also called the Embry Star. That is named after Nassar Embry, since he was the highest sitting official with everything. He was pretty much the leader of the eight. They named the highest recognition in a military career they could give to somebody, like everything that happened at Asheville Fields for the people who received their medals. They received the Embry Star, the highest recognition you can have from the government. Um, also with him, he was also, I have my notes right here pretty much he was the the main driving force for political power in the eight he led them the others led their own territories but pretty much anything he said went especially when it came to the other seven in the group um if he said something they were all discussed it but mostly his word was was law pretty much when it came to that next up we have another member called Olafsson. now i believe Olafsson is the one you can find a statue of in gears 5 along with nassar Embry. they both have statues that are shown Olafsson, the only time we ever get a mention of his name, really, is the school that Marcus went to, Dom went to, Carlos went to. Their school that they went to, not military, but just grade school, that was named after Olafsson. I believe it was Olafsson Public School was the name. He was... We don't know anything about him, really. These others, we don't know. The best we have of him is a statue compared to Pomeroy. But with Olafsson, I'd like to assume since the school is named after him, he must have been... 
again, they were all leaders of their own country, but I want to feel like they had distinct traits. I want to feel like he was a very knowledgeable person or like he was very wise or something out of the eight. He was very well, well read. You could say he's, he's an intellectual, you know, a school's named after him. So I'd like to assume that at least, um, Olafsson, that's it. We don't have anything else aside from the statue we have with the name being placed to it. So we know who it is. Uh, those are the only two we actually get to see when it comes to a physical thing. Nassar actually had a photo and a painting taken and it was placed in the, I believe the hall of sovereigns. It was placed in there along with the others of people who were very, very well known to the cog at the time. He was placed there because he was the leader of the, the all fathers pretty much. But you also have uh, Olafsson who has a statue in five along with him. So they were two very well known. I would like to think maybe even he was like a second in command because again, he has a statue you openly see that's there. So that'll do it for what we know about Olafsson. Now with Pomeroy, that's a fun one to assume because there's a lot of stuff named after him. There are ships, barracks, depots. I would like to assume Pomeroy was a very military heavy kind of guy. Like his country was really milita military esque. Like they've got him on battleships, they've got him on barracks for soldiers. I'd like to think he's a very war heavy kind of leader. We have nothing else from him aside from things that are named after him, but it is confirmed he is an all father. We don't have uh, we don't have paintings of him. We don't have a statue. There are statues in Gears Five that are seen. But we don't get to see them in detail. We don't get to see who they are. We only really get to get that in two because we have their models also that they were shown later on that the coalition released. So we do have that. We don't know anything about him except a lot of things involving war or anything involving military is really linked to him. So that's all we know about the main members of the All Fathers. There are still five unaccounted for him. We have no clue about. But there are more. There are more things leading to saying that like these guys had different traits or reasons how their countries were run. Like one of them might have been a very uh, intellectually high one because again, this was after the age of science. This was after the Renaissance stuff. So I want to imagine one of them was very high in the arts. One of them was very high in scholarly knowledge. One was very heavy in war. They didn't really practice war that much, but maybe they kept to the old ways and they at least wanted to practice it and know about it just in case anything were to happen. Um, you have a very political sense. Like I'm guessing when it came to Nassar Embry, his area was politics. I would like to assume that, but it's shown that like each of them have like their own traits that they're very well known for, as you can kind of see by where they are, what they're named with, or just how they kind of look in their photos. Because again, you do see the statue for them and you do get this idea. Um, there are one other, there's one other political group that kind of existed at that time. Now we had other countries that were outside of the cog. They were doing their own thing, leading their own countries. But there was like an underlying what's the best way to say it? The, uh, the best way to say it's the 1%. The 1% in the coalition held a lot of power. These families were considered the founding families. These families were very heavy in power. Probably the only people they answered to were the All Fathers themselves. That was probably the only people they really listened to. Other than that, if they barked in order, it probably went through. We only know of two of the founding families. We know there were a decent amount, but we don't really know you know, what they did to get really well known or what they did. We only know of two, and that is the Phoenix family and the Baird family. Surprisingly, two characters that we're very well familiar with, Marcus and ba and Dominic, ba Damon Baird. Dominic, the, the Santiago's weren't founders, I can tell you that right now. But those two, da Damon Baird and Marcus Phoenix, are descendants of the founding families, the two of them. The Baird family, by what we can tell, um, especially since his father was judicial and how the all fathers kind of had this idea of how things should be run. Um, I'm going to guess that his, his, his ancient lineage, well, not really ancient, it's only like 150 years old, but Damon's lineage is definitely in judicial. His father was a judge. I'm going to assume that the rest of his family were also judges and that's how they gained their political power as a family. Uh, when it comes to Marcus's family, that's more of like research development and military because it's stated that Marcus's grandfather was military. Adam was military and was also research and development. That's definitely why he was put on the on so highly regarded, not just because he was a phoenix. Marcus is a war hero. And then you have JD who's also fighting in the war currently going on with the swarm. So you do get this idea that they're a very war heavy family. Like they're, they're known for being soldiers. That's pretty much it. One known for judicial, one for military. Um, as for what they did back then that really got them noticed and kept their standards. Um, 
Maybe they got the luck of the draw and they won the lottery for all I know. That's that's the best I can say. It's not really stated what made the founding families so so rich and what made them so prosperous during that time. Again, most of the time during the Age of Silence, everyone was done with war. Everyone was just like, no, we're not going to do this. It's obviously been shown that if we constantly have, we keep butting heads, it's going to lead to the end of all this. We're just going to stop this and further us as humans. So I can kind of see like the founding families were kind of dirtbags and kind of just slither their way up the ranks and kind of just, I want to get some of them stole the, the money they have, or at least like backstab their way to it. Cause not everyone's going to play ball at that point of just like, everyone's not going to be violent. I'm not saying the Phoenix family did or the Baird family, but I'm guessing there were some, there were some real a-holes that probably existed back then that were rich and the snooty roll the wine glass kind, you know, and the upper crusts. I'm, I'm guessing there were a few of those, but as, as we currently know right now, the, the founding families are, they're not seen like the All Fathers. The All Fathers are seen as like how we see our forefathers or like the founding fathers for us. That's how we see them. Uh, for instance, there is a an All Fathers Day, like we have a President's Day. They're seen kind of in that regard, not like worshipped and preyed upon. Then we have the founding families, which were kind of like very respected and noble. Noble is probably the best word to say for them. And... For instance, when Marcus was on trial and you learn that he's a part of a founding family, it's not stated just like, oh, he's a founding family member, we need to back off. It's stated more like, your reputa your reputation with your name precedes you with where you come from, but at the end of the day, you did commit a crime, you do have to pay for it. So right now, the founding family like descendants aren't above the law. I'm guessing back then they were, but nowadays they aren't above the law. If anything were to happen or like they messed up, they're going to they're going to prison. It's going to happen. They're not safe from that. Uh, that's the founding families pretty much in a nutshell. Finishing off this video because I'm already going well into it and I even said I'm going to keep a lot of things out. Talking about Anya. Okay, so Anya is a really special case. Anya, Anya Phoenix Stroud or Anya Stroud or Anya Phoenix, however you want to say it. Anya is a topic as of right now in, in the cog, in the lore of what's going on right now. She's a topic. She is the one who took charge and pretty much took power after everything finished with the Lambent and the Locusts. Um, Marcus didn't want to lead. Cole and Baird definitely didn't want anything to do with leading. Hoffman at that point was just up for retiring and chilling with Bernie. No one wanted to lead. Anya had the best idea of how to lead and she held a good rank. So they said, you'll be in charge. You, you know what you're doing. We trust you. Anya, you're a smart person. Take over. And she did an extremely good job. She brought the cog back up to once they once were. Well, for standing-wise. For military power and population, it's still way off. But she brought them back up to being, you know, people wearing suits instead of wearing pretty much thrown-together clothes trying to survive a war. You know, she brought she brought everyone back up. Morale was brought back up. The the symbol of the cog was brought back up, something that she did believe in. She very much believed in the cog and how it was run. She just didn't believe in the people who were in charge at the time, especially towards the end with Prescott. But she felt like, we're going to bring this back up. We're going to become proper again. We're going to be a working government. We're going to be a people again. We're going to bring humanity back. And she did a great job of it. So great. Uh, the fertility program that Jin brought up, Anya was willing to, to try it. Of course, that led to her death later on, but she went ahead and tried it because, again, she wanted to put the people first. She understood that. So she did such a good job that towards the end of everything, when she died, uh, many people, including Jin, who was up for the idea and even asked Marcus, wanted to take her remains and bury them with the Allfathers, make her a ninth Allfather, pretty much. Uh, Marcus was heavily against it because, again, that was his wife. He's like, I'm not going to just throw my wife in a tomb and never be able to mourn or see her or anything again. I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm sure they would have allowed Marcus into the Allfathers, though. If they wouldn't have, that would have been horrible. But knowing Jin, she probably would have said no. But Anya was considered to be a recognized ninth Allfather because she helped bring everything back up to how it was. If everything was a Bible, the cog was a Bible, Allfathers were the Old Testament, Anya is the New Testament. Everyone considers it all together. That's kind of what it was. Anya brought about the second coming of the cog, and they considered her like, you're, you're an Allfather. You, you brought all of this. Um, unfortunately though, right now, if I had to say if she is or not, she probably isn't just because it really does seem like in the coalition, they consider, and it's stated by Prescott in the, the Kilo Squad Journal and Marcus talks about it with how many bo bodies there were in four. The body doesn't really matter too much. It's pretty much the memory that's carried. And I, I respect that idea. Um, for instance, Loomis picks up the cog tags in the Kilo Squad Survivor's Journal, 
and he says, this right here, this is all you go for when it comes to getting someone. You don't get the body, body's too much and it's going to weigh you down and kill you. This right here, this is going to last longer than by the time that body actually decomposes and everything's gone or if it's turned to ash. This is going to be around longer. Uh, Marcus had the same idea some, somewhat. Like, for instance, they said, you know, why didn't you get all the bodies? He said, there were so many things to do at the end of this war. Body, getting the bodies was the last of our concern. And Marcus really does carry the idea of memory very heavily. He carries around the memory of Ty and all them when he grabs their tags. He very much gets their tags. With the Allfathers, it's a little different by what it's seen. They do consider their remains something important. With Anya, it's a little different, though, because of the fact that her body was... They wanted her body with the rest of them. So they obviously went through and made sure the Allfathers' body, all eight of them, were still... Like, their physical bodies have d decayed by now, but, like, their remains were intact. They wanted Anya's remains with them. They wanted her to be resting with the people that made the cog. It does seem like if you held a really high standing in the cog, your body is actually something they care about. Um, as to as to how it works, it's never really described because they do state, like, get the tags, forget the body, memory is what we'll carry, which it, it just seems the opposite when it's like, we need to make sure the Allfather's corpses are all together. It's like, everyone knows who the Allfathers are. It's like, don't worry. If you lost their remains, it sucks, but everyone will be okay. It, it'll be okay. We'll be fine. There's many, in human history, there's many historical figures whose remains have gone lost or we can't find, but we still know who they are. It's, it's like, I get it for the cultural sense and to make sure everything is still running as the cog is, you know, it's nice to have the remains, but it's like, if you're going to have this dogma of just like, where you need to carry memory over body, never forget what they are. It's like, then at least carry that for like everybody. But I don't know. I, I guess that's just how they feel about it. But that's really going to do everything for the All Fathers. They're not really talked about that much. This video, this video is a long video. I say that in all my videos, but this one, there's barely any content revolving around these guys. Just bits and pieces. But I was able to tether together like a 20 plus minute video pretty much off this. Yeah, the, um, the All Fathers. The creators of the cog, pretty much. And Anya, if you want to consider her too, which I kind of could. Anya, Anya's okay. Um, that's going to do it for this video. There's not really much to go off of from here, but have a good one. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, we have a, we have a store. We've got a Patreon. We've got all this fun stuff. Uh, have a great one, guys. <laughs> Thank you for listening to pretty much the founding fathers of Gears. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, see you guys next time, next Thursday. Have a great one.